happy sabbath everyone and uh, wherever you are tuned in and uh, welcome to this morning presentation uh, being a sabbath of the lord we have been looking at the series of higher calling and today we continue in it and um, uh, this morning uh, it is morning here in east africa we are we are we are going to look at uh, true baptism we are going to look at uh, true baptism and so i want us to commit ourselves to prayer and then uh, begin our session let us pray our heavenly father we thank you for the night that has passed and the day you have given unto us as we share in the word this sabbath morning May it uh, impress our hearts and become a personality in us that we may be born again to walk in truth and righteousness never to sin again. Thank you for you always answer our prayers. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this this uh, Sabbath uh, we are looking at uh, the issue of uh, true baptism and uh, it is in the series uh, our higher calling and uh, i pray that uh, you will be blessed by the presentation in the book of john chapter 3 verses 3 to 5 we find uh, we find that uh, jesus communing with the uh, with nicodemus john chapter 3 There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do this miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Be born again. This is what we are going to look at. What is the true baptism and what is the implication of it? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god what is actually to be born again to be born again is to experience a conversion and christ says in john 1 12 as many as received him jesus christ to them he gave power power for what not to become the children of this world anymore but to become sons and daughters of God. Them not that are born of the will of the mother or the father, but according to the spirit. Everyone of us is called, we receive a first birth and we must receive the second birth in order to inherit the kingdom of God. This is the higher calling series and we are looking at true baptism. And I shall be looking at the baptism of water and the baptism of the spirit in the latter stages. So, Christ says that, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This is the conversion that we are talking uh, about. He died on Calvary, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw men unto me. John 12, 32. And so the work of Christ has been drawing men unto himself. 1 Corinthians 15. 3 to 4, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sin according to the scripture. If he died for our sin, so for, as I talked about the word forgiveness in the previous presentation, for is to give, is to exchange what you are having and give, to be given for another thing. So Christ died for our sin. This is beautiful. 
And this is interesting when you look at it keenly. Christ died for. If he died for, then it means that we owe him our sins. We owe Christ our sins. Christ died for our sins. We owe him our sin. And if we owe him our sins, then he owes us something. I, I can put that in, in quotes. We give him what he died for, and he gives us in exchange. Because when you give out something, you expect to get something. And so Christ died for our sin. We owe him our sin. And because we owe him our sin, if we give him what we have, then he has to give us something in exchange because uh, an exchange has to be both ways. Die. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And we are told that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. We are still in our sins if he did not rise again. So the resurrection of, the Jesus, of Jesus Christ puts everything in perspective. Meaning that if he resurrected, sin could not hold him down there. He, sin could have nothing against him. Was buried and rose again. Who dies then? Who dies then? Romans 6, 6 to 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So there is a death that has to happen in our lives. And if death happens, then the body of sin is destroyed. If the body of sin is destroyed, then Christ, when he went down, he resurrected with another body. We should resurrect with another body. For he that is dead is freed from sin. It is only those who have not died that are actually not freed from sin, but those who have died are freed from sin. When something dies, what do we do with it then? When something dies, what do we do then? For new life to begin, we must bury the old life. Look for this example. You take the seed and uh, it goes to the ground. It dies. But there is a living principle, a germinating principle in it that will make it sprout. But when the seed sprouts, it's no longer that seed. It's something else that will actually comes out even with a different shape we, you have the stalk there you have the stem and all you have the flowers you have buried something and it has died and the living principle that makes it now live it germinates it with a different body in, in fact in first corinthians chapter 15 we are told that um, we are sown in corruption but we are made alive with another body. There are diverse kinds of bodies. When you go down, go down with the corruptible and you come up with the spiritual. That is what First Corinthians chapter 15 says or talks about. So something must be buried for there to be life again. Something has to be buried so that it dies and then it germinates. Something has to be buried and then it has to germinate. So the biblical method represents, uh, we are told we are buried with Christ and then we resurrect in newness of life. If anyone be in Christ, he is made a new creature. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. So in baptism, we put forth the symbol of death and resurrection. Somebody has to die and somebody has to rise again. You are buried and then there is resurrection. Spiritual funeral and spiritual birthday. Maybe that is, can be shocking to you. There is a spiritual funeral and there is a spiritual birthday. You bury the old man and you declare to the whole world that something has taken effect in your life. Baptism is not just about being dipped into water. There must be something that is happening in your life so as to be manifested in the outside. The biblical method of baptism. 
and it has more significance. Steps to prepare for baptism. Believe, accepting Jesus Christ our Lord, personal Savior and Lord. And uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 37. The eunuch in the chariot, actually when Philip uh, comes to him and starts sharing with him the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 53, at the end, he asks, what prevented me from being baptized? And uh, Philip tells him, if thou believe that Christ is the Son of God, thou may. And he say, ah, I believe. And he was baptized. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So one of the prerequisites of baptism is to believe that Christ is the Son of God. But I'm not going to that controversy. Repent. Sorrow for sin and turning from sin, Acts 2.38. There must be a repentance of sin, not a sorrowing or after the guilt that you have, but a true uh, realization that you have hurt the person of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit and you have wounded him afresh and crucified him afresh on the cross. We repent, and repentance has to do with confessing and turning away from that sin. Sorrow for sin and turning from the sin. You have wounded Christ and his name. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. So, believe, accepting Jesus Christ, our Lord, as a personal Savior, repent, sorrow for sin, obey, obedient to the commandments of God. Matthew 28, 19, 20 says that go ye teach, baptize teach them to observe all things that whatsoever have commanded thee to do, and lo, I am with you till the end of the age. And so one of the prerequisites of um, going into the step of baptism is to believe, accept Christ as the personal Savior, repent, and obedience to the commandments of God is paramount for you to get baptism. These are the things that should be considered before a person takes the steps of baptism. How do we prepare young people for baptism? Candidates who have grown to manhood and womanhood should understand their duty better than do the younger ones. But the pastor of the church has a duty to do for these souls. Have they wrong habits and practices? It is the duty of the pastor to have special meetings with them, give them Bible readings, converse and pray with them, and plainly show the claims of the Lord upon them. Read to them the teaching of the Bible in regard to conversion. Show what is the fruit of conversion. The evidence that they love God show that true conversion is a change of heart, of thoughts, and purposes. Evil habits are to be given up. The sins of evil speaking, of jealousy, of disobedience are to be put away. A warfare must be waged against every evil trait of character. Then the believing one can understandingly take to himself the promise, Ask, and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, 7. This is uh, uh, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 95. Examination of the candidates. We are talking about true baptism. The series is our higher calling. The test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. It should be understood whether they are simply taking the name of Seventh-day Adventists or whether they are taking their stand on the Lord's side to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Before baptism, there should be a thorough inquiry as to the experience of the candidates. Let this inquiry be made, not in a cold and distant way, but kindly, tenderly, pointing the new converts to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Bring the requirements of the gospel to bear upon the candidates for baptism. One of the points upon which those newly come to the faith will need instruction is the subject of dress. Let the new converts be faithfully dealt with. Are they vain in dress? Do they cherish pride of heart? The idolatry of dress is a moral disease. It must not be taken over into the new life. In most cases, submission to the gospel requirement will demand a decided change in the dress. Evangelism 3.12.1 There should be no carelessness in dress. For Christ's sake, whose witnesses we are, we should seek to make the best of our appearances. In the tabernacle service, God specifically specified every detail concerning the garments of, this, of those who ministered before him. Thus we are taught that he has a preference in regard to the dress of those who serve him. Very specific were the directions given in regard of, to Aaron's robes, for his dress was symbolic. So the dress of Christ's followers should be as symbolic. In all things we are to be representatives of him. 
Our appearance in every respect should be characterized by neatness, modesty, and purity. But the word of God gives no sanction to the making of changes in apparel merely for the sake of fashion that we may appear like the world. Christians are to decorate the person with costly arrays. Christians are not to decorate the person with costly array or expensive ornaments. So one of the uh, of subjects that should be dealt with before people are accepted for baptism is the dress code. The words of scriptures in regard to dress should be carefully considered. We need to understand that which the Lord of heaven appreciates in even dressing of the body. All who are in earnest all who are in earnest in seeking for the grace of Christ will heed the precious words of instruction inspired by God. Even the style of the apparel will express the truth of the gospel. All who study the life of Christ and practice his teachings will become like Christ. Their influence will be like his. They will reveal soundness of character. As they walk in the humble path of obedience, doing the will of God, they exert an influence that tells for the advancement of the cause of God and the healthful purity of his work. In these thoroughly converted souls, the world is to have a witness to the sanctifying power of truth upon the human character. So baptism shows that um, your life is a sanctified life. The knowledge of God and uh, Jesus Christ expressed in his character is an exaltation above everything that is esteemed in earth or in heaven. It is the very highest education. It is the key that opens the portals of the heavenly city. This knowledge is to be, is, is God's purpose that all who put on Christ by baptism shall possess. And it is the duty of God's servant to set before those souls the privilege of their high calling in Christ Jesus. Judge by the fruit of the life. There is one thing that we have no right to do, and that is to judge another man's heart or impurge his motives. But when a person presents himself as a candidate for church membership, we are to examine the fruit of his life and leave the responsibility of his motive with himself. But great care should be exercised in accepting members into the church, for Satan has his specious devices through which he purposes to crowd false brethren into the church, through whom he can work more successfully to weaken the cause of God. Review and Herald, January 10, 1893. So, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 16. To believe in the name of the Lord is to do his will and not just to consent by lip service. Should I wait till I am perfect before being baptized? We, we, we look at the steps of conversion. Why is it that the people don't change for the better? Why is it that people don't change for the better? What could be the problem then? Why is it that even after the most stirring sermon have been preached, people still do not leave their evil habits? They acknowledge the truth intellectually but deny the power thereof. If it is for the first time they hear such a message, they get moved, they feel how far they have gone off the path of life. But let them go home, they console themselves for they are not only once guilty. They become bold in transgression and even mock those who preach the truth that once moved them so much. What could be the problem? Why don't people change and forsake their evil ways even after knowing the saving truth? What could be the problem? We continue to ask. Could it be that the living word is not strong enough to change us? Could it be that the latter find out, we later find out that we once believed was a lie? What could be the problem? Why do people profess goldness but deny the power thereof? The problem must be with us, not the word of God. It is with us. Let us then have a spiritual look at the process of conversion. Where could we be missing the link? The stages of conversion. Getting to know the truth. For faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. And how shall they know of the word if a person is not sent to them to preach unto them? So the first st stages of conversion is getting to the truth. Seeing Christ as your personal Savior, receiving Him in your life as a personal Savior, and uh, accepting us it as truth. Somebody preaches, you hear the truth and accept it as truth. Feeling sorry for having done wrong, confessing the wrong. Accept the truth. And remember, confession and repentance is a gift given by God. Without the moving of the Spirit, you will never know what is the truth. You will never accept it and will never feel sorry. Praying for power to overcome the wrong and doing our part in resisting temptation. 
we have to cast wholly ourselves unto the Lord so that we may continue in this conversion. The fully converted man, the new man then. These are the stages I can put on the screen of conversion. Now let us look at um, every stage in detail and find out where we are. We usually stop. Getting to know the truth. The first step to conversion is to have the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. The concern must be awakened. Right and wrong must be known by us. This is what pastors are to do. To make right plain before the congregation as to leave no doubt as to what constitutes it. Right is the will of God. Wrong is that which is contrary to his will. This will is revealed in the Bible. So all that the Holy Bible condemns is wrong must be for second. We must all have a habit or prayerfully of prayerfully studying the word the, the Bible so that we may know it for ourselves. And uh, this is where there is a big problem. People don't study the Bible for themselves. They wait for someone to come and tell them even after being introduced to the truth they still have a problem in studying the word of God for themselves. Yes, we must not, like just a, a person doesn't uh, feed for you, even the spiritual food, you can't be, somebody can't, can't eat for you. Somebody can't eat for you the spiritual food we must eat uh, for ourselves and uh, know of the Lord. Uh, the Lord has said that whoever seeks him shall be found of him. So we must all have a habit of prayerfully studying the, the Bible so that we may know if it for ourselves. We must not depend on pastors. They have a work to do so are we for ourselves. The Bible is so large and deep we must not depend on pastors, no, it is content. We must read it for ourselves if we are to know the fear of God. Each Christian must study the Holy Scriptures daily for himself. In this we have no excuse. <coughs> Sorry. All that shun it, it is because their deeds are evil. All that abstain from attending church services and studying the Bible, it is because their deeds are evil and they are hiding from the truth. They are living in denial that they need Jesus Christ to save them. So, we, we should, as um, pastors, as elders and laymen, we should be encouraging people to study the Bible for themselves. They should not wait until the Sabbath reaches that um, they may hear once in a while the word of God, but daily they must come to God and uh, learn of God through the reading of the Bible. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, here if thou carest Christ after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seeketh her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the uh, knowledge of God. Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. We must search the scriptures for ourselves and cry unto the Lord to show us what is truth. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 8 13. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light and that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. So if we like to our sins to be consumed, what we have to do is come to the Lord and he will be able to consume our iniquities and give us his righteous character. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 14 and 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of uh, good things. So someone must have a preacher, preach to them, and then direct this person 
to seek for Christ and also be an instrument to others to carry the gospel unto other parts. For we are not uh, preached to and uh, receive conversion to now walk in idleness, but uh, to lead also others unto truth. And uh, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That is uh, uh, from the book of uh, Isaiah. From the book of Isaiah. And, uh, but they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? In uh, Isaiah 53 verse 1. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily they sound well into all. Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? But to Israel he said, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto disobedient and gainsaying people. So, in a true baptism, faith must be practiced, the hearing of the word of God, uh, a true repentance, turning away, and daily communing with God, daily feeding on his word. And it's not just reading it as a mere reading of a novel, but... Uh, reading it prayerfully and studying it prayerfully, believing that it contains the divinity of Christ. None is excusable from sin. The truth is a light everywhere, especially in our present world, where there is the greatest circulation of the Bible than any time in this world history. Those who deliberately stay away from knowing the truth when they can get it will be judged as though they knew it. We must all be in pursuit of the living truth. It is the greatest work we have to do for ourselves, and none will be held guiltless who does not engage in this work while he knows how to read and has the Holy Bible within his reach. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hosea 4.6 for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. Hosea 6, 6. God desired that we know him, that we know his will for us. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Christ Jesus, whom thou hast sent. This is the knowledge that the Lord requires. It is not just knowing about the ontological reality of the Son of God and knowing about the Father. No, it is having and possessing their character, their humility, their attributes partaking of the, their divine nature. That is the first step. We have to know the truth for ourselves. Unfortunately, many just have an intellectual understanding of the truth and stop here. Our, our first steps into true baptism is to, we have to know the truth for ourselves. Unfortunately, this is a step that is not taken by many. They are often puzzled at what it is. They look at it as one who look at a foreign object fallen on earth from Jupiter. They look at the pastor as a religious genius, such as are considered despisers. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, Acts 13, 41. Don't wait for anyone to reveal to you what is truth. Yes, a person will be sent to preach to you, but after that, Christ take over. The Holy Spirit has to guide you into all truth. Accept the truth, the second step. The truth must not only, not only be understood, it must be accepted, it must be cherished. I must not be sold for any tinsel that may appear to look like it, but what do most people do even after receiving the truth? Let us get what the Bible says. First step is know the truth for yourself in true baptism. The second step, accept the truth. Why then is the people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast this is. They refuse to return. I hearken and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his cause as though as the horse rushes into the battle. Jeremiah 8, 5 to 6. Accepting the truth. They will not accept it. Jeremiah 8, 8 to 9. Listen what it says. Instead, it is found out that preachers, fake preachers, work night and day to invent a lie. They work so hard to preach error. Those who 
or once believe the truth are fastened by these lies, then vain philosophies of men and the vain philosophies of men and start holding loosely on the truth and more strongly on the lie till in the very end they hold fast the lie and hate and mock of truth and it is our advocate. You wonder why uh, the world receives error so much and uh, truth is not appreciated. It is because of uh, selfishness in the hearts of many. They will want to have something a new spoken to them. They will have that um, they, 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 they will not want to leave their comfort zones for truth. Truth becomes to them a lie and lie becomes a truth unto them. And so truth is not uh, appreciated. And so how do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. So, steps to, to baptism, know the truth, accept the truth. But here, people do not accept the truth because they find it so cutting and disturbing their own uh, darling, cherished sins. And so, they become antagonistic to the truth. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Jeremiah 3.11 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 1 John 1, 6 and 10 Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not all at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation they shall be cast down saith the lord jeremiah 8 12 accepting the truth has been become something so difficult to people but those that love god accept the truth and consider they have transgressed against god they do not hide their sins in the vain philosophies of men the rudiments of human philosophy i'll instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go i'll guide thee with thine eye be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bit, or lest they come near unto thee. Psalms 32, 8. Accept the truth as it is in the Lord, and see it work in your life. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity or foolishness, and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set at not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Proverbs 1, 22-25 The wise man is lamenting, men who could not hear reproof. After getting to know the truth and having accepted it, a conviction is aroused in the heart of the evil that we may we have for so long delighted in unknowingly. A need is created to make peace with God. Forgiveness is sought for honestly. The child of God goes on his knees and confesses his sins before God, asking him to pardon and blot out the sins recorded against his name in the book that is above. So, after knowing the truth, accept the truth, and then confess the wrong. Third step. I hearken and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you look at uh, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah chapter 3, it talks about why the latter rain has not come. And uh, let us just uh, briefly look at it. It is something that I have shared somehow largely in the past, but uh, in passing, I'll just like to read of it. The book of uh, Jeremiah. Chapter 3, verse 3. For we are looking at the steps to true baptism. Know the truth, accept the truth, confess the wrong. We have been praying for the latter rain, it has never come. Chapter 3, verse 3 of Jeremiah. Therefore the showers have been with holden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a worse, and thou hadst a worse forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. Because 
People are not ashamed of their sin. People refuse to confess and repent. The latter rain has not come. And it will never come if we don't confess and repent of our sins. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses is made. confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10.10 10. It is not enough to believe the truth. We must show remorse for the sins we have committed. Sins not confessed and forsaken shall not be forgiven. When you wrong somebody to make peace with him means that you must be sorry to him for what you did and not repeat the same. And uh, in this matter of forgiving, of confessing our sins and repenting, uh, I'll just slip in something from uh, the spirit of prophecy. I didn't uh, want to do that, but uh, let me try and uh, put in something. Uh, this is uh, Prophets and Kings, page 78, paragraph 2. The true pen penitent does not put his past sins from his remembrance. He does not assume as he has obtained peace, grow unconcerned in regard to the mistakes he has made. He thinks of those who have been led into evil by his cause and tries in every possible way to lead them back into the true path. The clearer the light that he has entered into, the stronger is his desire to set the feet of others in the right way. He does not gloss over his wayward course, but his wrong. He does not gloss over his wayward course, making his wrong a light thing, but leaves the danger signal that others may take a warning. So, if you have led others into sin, and the clear light has entered into you. You have to set the feet of others in the right way, those whom you have made to sin. This is what is called confession and repenting in the right way. Seek to make the feet of those whom you have plunged to sin uh, follow the right way. So it is not enough to believe the truth. We must show remorse for the sins we have committed. Sins not confessed and forsaken shall not be forgiven. And we should seek to set aright those whom we have led to sin to go into the right ways. Only knowledge, acknowledge thy own iniquity, and thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, said the Lord. Jeremiah 3.13 I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgettest the iniquity of thy sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Psalms 32, 5 to 6. And so, but many having resisted the truth, see absolutely need to confess their sins before God. They continue in the path of error because they have rejected the light. To them sin is no more sin but righteousness. They love it. They indulge in it. In it. They cherish it. To resist it never even flashes in their mind. They are on the death land, cruising to the eternal destruction. It is with a thrill that they go to death and are so drunk with it that they cannot resist temptation. They are drowsy till the day they shall awake in hell when real death knocks at their lives. Know the truth, brother. Accept the truth. Confess your sins, and in confession and repentance, those whom you have led into sin, seek to set them on the right path once again. The fourth thing is in true baptism. We are looking at true baptism in this uh, series, Our Higher Calling. The fourth step in true baptism is uh, resisting temptation. Remember, step number one is know the truth. Step number two, accept the truth. Step number three, confess and repent. And step number four, resist temptation. After confession, one prays for strength to overcome temptation and sin. And uh, we normally only pray uh, that Lord give us power to resist sin. But do you know how you overcome sin? It is not only by the power to overcome it. Overcome evil by doing good. We have the devil to resist and temptation to overcome. Satan never forces himself on anyone. So is God. We choose who will reign in our hearts. 
why do we say Satan never forces himself on anyone? Satan can't read your mind. It is He only works with what you have given him. It is only God and angels who can read your mind. This involves a deliberate effort to stay away from the tempting situations and a fervent prayer to overcome whenever one comes our way. We are not machines. We are free human beings with a will to exercise. No temptation that comes to anyone is too strong for him to overcome. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says so. We therefore can live a victorious life over sin. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feigned, uh, uh, saith the Lord. We are to return unto God wholeheartedly. We are to forsake our sins completely, never to return to them. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that um, love him. God does not only give us the power to overcome sin, but he gives us power to do good in his vineyard. He gives us power to do good. And so, the reason why many people have not had an experience of uh, overcoming sin, it is uh, because they have sat and prayed that um, they may overcome sin, but they have not taken the practical duties of overcoming sin. And what are the practical duties of overcoming sin? It is uh, doing good. The practical aspect of overcoming sin is doing good. And so we are told, Blesses the man that endure the temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Christ's victory is our victory. We don't have to walk in a mournful way. We don't have to walk as a people who are defeated. We are, Satan is a defeated foe. We are fighting with the defeated foe. Only what we have to do is submit to the Lord. Many are not walk, working out their salvation with fear and trembling. They are not diligent in fighting against sin. They give a fainting half will to God and soon they are overcome. They have cherished sin that pleased them and this they do not want to forsake. Rebukes and admonition are very less if not nothing to them. They have not the eye of faith to see sin in its real nature and how God abhors it. They still palliate with some. We can overcome all through Jesus Christ who gives us strength to do all things to his glory. Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have not yet resisted and to blood striving against sin. Hebrews 12, 4. And uh, on this issue, the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, is so essential to us. Philippians 4, 8. Uh, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think of those things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So it's not just about knowing sin and resisting it. It is about knowing the good things and Paul saying, if you do them, these things you shall finally triumph over the evil one. In, in fact, the antidote of overcoming sin is Isaiah chapter 58. We are told that the antidote of sin the antidote of sickness, the antidote of this world troubles is Isaiah chapter 58. As uh, How is character formation completed? Allow me to just give you this. How is character formation completed? How it is attained? How it is accomplished? How it is accomplished? Christ Object Lesson, page 384, paragraph uh, 
two. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within, when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. So, Christian character, it is completion, its completeness is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. This is how Christian character is, actually. It is completeness, it's attained. But, um, People do not want to do good. They want to resist sin, but they don't want to resist it by doing good. And so the spirit has to be implanted in our lives to be able to do good and not only to resist sin, but to do good. And... Uh, We, we find that, um, let me share with you something. This is important. Uh, it is uh, in Christ object lesson. Mm. Can I find it? Yes. So, look at this. The Lord says that um, the poor shall not cease The poor shall not cease to be amongst us. And why shall not the poor cease to be amongst us? It is uh, one way of God using it to, to refine our character. It is one way of God using it to refine our character. So when we open our hearts and our means to the poor actually our character shall be uh, accomplished in uh, Ministry of Healing page 186 paragraph 2 the, the this arrangement did not however only do away with the poverty it was not God's purpose that poverty should only cease it is one of his means for the development of character. The poor, he says, shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command this, saying, Thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. This is one of the means of um, having character, uh, a character formed within us that is ennobling. And so we are looking at um, the steps to true baptism. One, we found out is know the truth. Second is uh, accept the truth, confess, and then resist temptation. And uh, in resisting temptation, we understand that um, one of the ways, better ways of resisting temptation is doing good. No wonder many have sickly Christian experience. Why? Because they are not practicing good. There is no life in the experience. They do not cherish the Bible. They do not diligently study it. These are not given to unceasing prayer. They profess godliness but deny the power thereof. The new man cannot be formed within. Jesus cannot occupy a divided heart. They cannot reflect the character of Jesus because they do not have him within their hearts. And you know that um, the sole purpose of Jesus Christ, he received all so that he may give all. Uh, the life of Christ was lived for others. He left everything in heaven so that uh, he may come and uh, uh, and serve us he became a servant
but many not wanting to be servants have lost their ex Christian experience and uh, they will never regain it until they start practicing the ABC of salvation. And uh, the new man, but as many as received him, to them gave him he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe uh, on his name, John 1, 12. To receive Christ, to receive the word of God, which is the Bible. See Revelation 19, 13. It is to receive that word holy and apply it into your daily life. It is being baptized in him. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. And talking about baptism, we have the baptism of water and the baptism of the Spirit. And I'll not cite this so much. Baptism of water, you know it. It's being immersed in the water. Dying with Christ as a symbol of dying with Christ and resurrecting with him. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the fire. When you look at the book of Acts, the whole of it. It is that uh, when people had uh, been taught, they and they were baptized, they received the baptism of the Spirit, that is, obtaining the gift therein. You find that many speak, speak in tongues, many did miracles, this is the baptism of the Spirit, this is the baptism of fire. It is walking in the light you receive. As a new man, what is a new man? It is walking in the light as you receive it. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. John 12:36. All are God's creation, only those that are led by the Holy Spirit, only those that walk in the light of the Bible are God's children. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Romans 8, 14. Only those that diligently do God's will are truly converted. Jesus Christ, who delighted in keeping God's commandment, is fully formed within. This mourn whenever they fall, repent, and rise up. Sin in their lives. The world and the church grieves their heart. Do you? Are you his child? Where could be the problem then? In our conversion. Many people go to church but only for what to do. They are not given the, to the living God. Few Christians study the Bible and few of those do it daily. Few of the few study diligently and yet few of the few pay keen attention to what they read. They read to confirm what they already believe, not to get what God has for them. They are prejudiced. Many understand the truth when spoken, and that is the father they are willing to go. Let us some become brave to mock the truth they once believed, and here they don't receive true baptism. Of the few who accept the truth, few hold fast to them till the end, but only intellectually. The rest become corrupted somewhere along the way. Of the few who receive the truth, few, a lot many few, ever feel remorse for the sin they have committed. This is where the major problem is. The majority wander at the truth and soon will perish. Their concerns are dead and is hardly awakened from the spiritual stupor. They learn but never come to the living knowledge of the truth. They do not confess of their exposed sins. They do not ask themselves, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? They do not feel sorry for what they have done. They therefore continue in their sins because they do not deeply feel the wrong they have committed. This will miss the seal of God on their foreheads. They do not cry and sigh for the sins that are done in the land, for they are part of it. They cannot pray for power to overcome. Indeed, they cannot remember when they last prayed for strength to overcome sin, except in the routine chanting of the Lord's Prayer. You be such a one, beloved. So, could you be such a one? Have you ever felt sorry for the way you dress, the way you eat, speak, deal with your children? Disobey your parents, profane the holy Sabbath of the Lord, steal from God in tithes and offering, the things you watch, the music you listen to, your unfaithfulness to your spouse, etc. Are these things part of your life? Why haven't you experienced a true baptism? Maybe you must have a checklist to see if the Spirit of the Lord is in you. Because the Spirit of the Lord, if the Spirit of the Lord is in you, you will bear the fruit of the Spirit. But if it's not in you, then you will have a lot of lists to check on. You will have a lot of things to do. Allow Christ to work in you. Allow his word to have an entrance in your life. Have you ever gone back home after someone and confessed to God your sins that were revealed to you in the service? Have you ever then followed it with a prayer to overcome, never to go back? Have you ever prayed for strength to do good, brother? What do you of often do? Be puzzled at the truth, then ignore it. 
Later, totally feel unmoved by subsequent preaching of the same, still you descend lower and mock the truth and her advocates. You have no desire to pursue after God, none whatsoever. You know it and God does too. You have not submitted your will to him to control and guide. No wonder even the most stirring someone do not benefit you. Many times, someone do not benefit us. Only acknowledge your sin and come back to God. He is a father who is willing to accept his children back. Have a desire to change for the better. Then cry to God for power and you will overcome. It, we don't have to do something so grievous to receive true baptism. No, we have just to submit ourselves to God. We have to submit ourselves to God and change will come. And so, repent our iniquities. Christ says in Ezekiel chapter 11, and I'll give them one heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them an heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes, and keep my ordinances, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I'll be their God. This is what Christ is waiting to breathe upon us, to sprinkle his water upon us, so that we may receive this true baptism. It is not just a matter of of being dipped in water and coming out. No, brothers and sisters, this is not the true baptism you are talking about. We have received a higher calling, and this higher calling is to look like Christ. He was born twice. We have to be born twice. We have to receive him fully. A new heart also I'll give to you, a new and a new spirit will I put within you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. This is what God is willing to do. He is yearning that we may receive this new baptism, true baptism from him. Learn from the parable of the sower. Be the good soil which brought forth abundant fruit. The problem is not in the sower. The problem is with the soil. The, so the problem is with me and you. We don't want to avail ourselves as a good soil. Let Jesus change you. Let God change you. And uh, how I pray that um, we will wholly give ourselves unto Christ. If there be anything that we are still holding on to as a people, let us put it aside and Christ work in our life. And let us receive this new baptism, this true baptism. The baptism that allows Christ to consume all the desires of the flesh, all the sinful lusts of the flesh, and then our hearts be intertwined with him. Otherwise, God bless you, and uh, let this Sabbath be a Sabbath that will start a new life in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath that has double blessing unto us. There are many who are struggling with one or another thing. Lord, they want to give their hearts unto thee, but they can't. Some are stuck in fornication, adultery, alcoholism, addictions. But Lord, thou art a father who is not blind and deaf unto the desires of thy children. May you reach to such a one who actually is penitently repenting of their sin. Lord, do not only give them power to overcome sin, give them the power and give all us power to do good. Help us to practice Isaiah chapter 58, to show forth the fruit of the Spirit. And thank you because, Lord, you have just given us Jesus Christ, the Comforter, the one who will give us peace. You have promised in Isaiah 26, 3, thou shalt uh, keep him in perfect peace. He who has stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. This is what, Lord, we are claiming this morning that you may give us a perfect peace, a peace that comes from understanding that our sins have been forgiven and you don't look at us with a suspicion, suspicious eye, but you look at us as a father who looks upon a tender child. Thank you for accepting us once again this morning. It is in Jesus' name we ask of these things. Amen. God bless you and uh, I'm praying that uh, you may have uh, a blessed Sabbath. Be blessed.